Hi guys, this is Ben. Hi, I'm Emily. I'm Steph. And we're coming at you from Evolve Sport Nutrition to deliver you the environmentally friendly sports nutrition webinar. So thank you for so much for tuning in. And what we're going to do right now is we apologize for this minor hiccup, but we're going to share our screen with you just so you can see our webinar slides and we can get down to brass tacks. So let's do this. Um, so first and foremost, uh, all right, so like you already know, you're tuning in for the environmentally friendly sports and nutrition. Now we're gonna cover a lot of material today. We're gonna to talk about a lot of information. So hopefully you got your pen and paper uh, ready for you. But if not, don't worry. We're gonna keep this video up on YouTube for you to rewatch a couple of times. And of course, uh, to like and share to any fr anyone that's a little bit more concerned about trying to make some uh, different choices in regards to your food, uh, but not sacrifice your um, nutrition and your overall health, especially for your athletic performance. So, but before we get into the information, we'd like to introduce ourselves a little bit more. Um, now, uh, of course, you've already met me. My name is Ben, and uh, my training was done uh, in the world of nutrition for at uh, Ryerson University and then at Sunnybrook Hospital, where after a few years of working in um, as a dietitian, I trained as a sports dietitian with the Sports Dietitians of Australia. Um, also became a personal trainer and an athlete where my sports are uh, triathlons as well as marathons. So uh, in ESN, I specialize working with the endurance athletes um, and a lot of high, high functioning level athletes. So the for marathoners and triathletes, I work with quite a bit. Um, and of course, these pictures are me completing my first half Ironman um, and uh, two years ago in the Chicago Marathon. Perfect. And again, my name is Emily and I'm a sports dietitian as well with Evolve Sport Nutrition. Um, you may have guessed by the photos, I am a, a CrossFitter and Olympic uh, lifter. And by background, I actually have done long distance running as well and dancing. Um, I was trained at Ryerson University and I did my internship at Grand River Hospital in Kitchener. And to specialize in the sport nutrition field, I've taken a couple of courses through dietitians of Canada and some uh, sport nutrition conferences that have been avail available as well as guidance um, through Ben with Evolve Sport and Nutrition and I do specialize in CrossFit, strength training and Olympic lifting when it comes to sport nutrition. I'm also a vegetarian ovo lacto and I do like to prove that it's possible to be strong and make those gains while still living a vegetarian lifestyle so I'm excited to share my knowledge with you guys today. And my name, Steph, uh, once again. Uh, my nutrition training was done at um, Brescia or Western University. Um, and then further again, I did my master's in nutrition at um, Ryerson. Um, while I was in school, I was a varsity athlete on the both the cross country and the track teams, um, specializing in the longer distances. Um, since finishing school, I'm still pursuing running competitively. I competed at the Canadian Half Marathon uh, Championships a couple years ago, so still keeping after it. Um, in the company, I work primarily with um, endurance athletes um, as well. Um, and I guess I'd consider myself more of a flexitarian. So I try to eat kind of when I'm at home, vegan um, foods, vegetarian foods as much as possible, but I might um, indulge in some animal-based proteins um, while I'm out. So looking forward to sharing my knowledge as well. Yeah. And I forgot to mention that I am a flexitarian as well. So uh, along the same as Steph, and you'll learn about more about what a flexitarian is in a little bit, but I myself cook uh, primarily uh, ex exclusively lacto ovo vegetarian and vegan when I'm at home, but also uh, will engage in the animal protein sources while we're out. Now, uh, now that you know us a little bit, we're going to talk about exactly uh, what you can expect to get from this webinar today is a little bit of an understanding between the subtle differences between sports nutrition and general nutrition because there are quite a big uh, a number of differences there um we can we're going to talk about food choices that will uh, that relate to reducing our carbon footprint um as well as a discussion about uh, vegetarian and veganism and uh some of the nutritional considerations we have for vegetarian athletes because being vegetarians and flexitarians ourselves we work with a lot of uh, vegetarian athletes to get them back on track with their nutrition and their eating because we are seeing many many more of this and it makes the three of us very very happy at ASN because 
because we are, um, you know, we're, we're big, big uh, lovers of this kind of lifestyle. And uh, you'll start to understand why in a little bit once we get into this and we'll get into this right now. So first and foremost, we have to talk about the importance of sports nutrition. And we're going to talk about the difference between sports nutrition and regular nutrition. But primarily the reason why is because I always say to people for athletes or anyone that's physically active, you have to think of your body as a high performance car. So let's for example, say a sports car, um, you wouldn't run your performance car on regular fuel. Why would you run your body? Um, you would run it with, uh, you know, high octane fuel, the mere pure fuel. Why would you run your body on junk? And it's very much the same way with sports nutrition. Of course, there's foods that fuel us a lot better out there, but of course, there's a lot of misinformation out there as to which foods fuel us better. Um, the other issue too is there's some poor food labeling regulations uh, in North America about what can be labeled on, um, uh, put on specific labels. And of course, that has more to do with the supplement industry, which is largely self-regulated um, and not so much um, regulated by the FDA as much as food and drug are. So the philosophy for Food and drug is that it's not safe until proven so, which is why there's a lot of research behind it and a lot of clinical trials to prove that a, a food or a drug is safe for the general population. But for the supplement industry, it's a little bit of the opposite philosophy where something is safe until proven otherwise. So it's up to the consumers as well as medical professionals uh, to report adverse reactions, which typically don't happen in the supplement industry. So it's a little bit it's it's quite quite different um and of course sports nutrition is not only a discussion of supplements but of course supplements are very very important um but we are primarily talking about food and the biggest difference between sports nutrition and general nutrition is of course the types of foods that we're eating where in sports nutrition we're favoring actually fast digestion foods isolated macronutrients um, and of course looking at the timing of which we eat um, the difference being for general nutrition we're looking at foods to really really break down slowly to give a slow release of nutrition uh, proteins amino acids as well as calories over the course of the day to keep us a little bit healthier and uh, have a better uh, um, energy outputs and energy um, uh, levels throughout the day versus sports and nutrition where we're looking at everything breaking down as fast as possible to digest as possible uh, fast as possible and to uh, really serve the energy pathways that we're using during our physical activity we also have for sports and nutri nutrition uh, increased micronutrient requirements um, and of course increased protein requirements to help us build and repair those lean muscle masses um, the concept with general nutrition is of course to look at at balance and of course the philosophy with sports and nutrition is to feed what we're using so there's a very very big difference and a lot of people have a good understanding of what general and healthy eating is for general nutrition and oftentimes they're quite shocked to find out sports nutrition is um, quite a different philosophy so uh, and of course you're all here today to learn a little bit more about that so here we go Awesome. So we thought we'd start a little bit uh, by talking about the world as a whole and kind of what's going on with our population and how that can impact our food and nutrition. So we're all well aware that the population on the planet is increasing. We're currently at 7.2 billion people. And this number is expected to rise to 10 billion by the year 2050. Now, two thirds of this population are expected to live in urban areas, which is a very concentrated amount of people. So this calls into question how we're gonna feed all these people and how we're gonna feed them nutrient dense foods. So it's especially of concern for our physically active individuals and athletes who already have higher nutritional requirements and energy demands compared to the general population. So we need to consider kind of what we're gonna do going forward to feed all these people. This is a nice graph by the uh, World Resources Institute on calorie consumption in the world. And we can see here from this chart that it highlights that globally, we're consuming more calories. We're consuming many more calories than we were before. And although Canada isn't on this slide, we can assume that we're fairly in line with the United States line being in North America and similar uh, lifestyle habits and food consuming habits. So on average, the world is consuming about 3000 calories daily, which is quite a high amount. And combining this with the fact that our population is increasing, we really need to be creative and figure out how we're going to feed everybody, 
ideally in a way that's healthy and nutritious. So why is this a problem then? So animal-based um, protein, the demand for these proteins are expected to increase. And by the year 2050, we're gonna see about an 80% increase. Um, particularly, um, the demand for beef is going to increase by 95%. Um, so the highest consumption of these animal proteins is in the developed world. The problem with this increasing demand for animal proteins is that they generally cost more resources to develop. So beef um, uses about 20 times more land and creates 20 times more greenhouse gas than veggie protein. Chicken and pork, although not quite as demanding, um, still create three times more land and create three times more greenhouse gas emissions than the veggie protein. Um, so again, another um, graph from the World Resource Institute. Um, similar to the calories over the years, as nations have become uh, more urban, we have an increased um, number of people in the world, the citizens are diversifying their diet, um, and they're also consuming more animal-based foods like beef, dairy, pork, chicken, and eggs. So um, in 2009, the global average per person protein consumption um, exceeded the dietary requirements, with each person consuming an average of about 68 grams per day, which is almost one third higher than the daily average adult requirement. In wealthy countries, this protein consumption was even higher still. Um, so the average American man eats nearly 100 grams of protein per day, which is almost double the protein um, needs. Um, in this chart here, it, we're illustrating um, how much more resource intensive animal based foods are um, on the right hand side than the plant based foods. So the um, bars in green illustrate the land use to produce the various um, foods. Um, fresh water consumption required is illustrated in the blue and then greenhouse gas emissions is illustrated in the orange and yellow. So on the left hand side um, are the plant based foods um, and we can see that they um, require a lot less of all the resources um, than the animal based foods over on the right hand side. Um, and one kind of striking thing that really pops out is beef. Um, so we'll say the biggest beef is with beef. Um, this graph here um, illustrates the edible output per feed input. So um, on the left hand side here, beef is extremely inefficient to produce. Um, cattle consume a large amount of calories and protein in order to produce a relatively small amount of calories and protein for human consumption. Um, sheep and goat are similarly inefficient um, converters of feed to food, but they're eaten um, on a much smaller scale globally, so they don't have quite an impact. Um, so beef production requires large quantities of land and water per unit of protein and calorie consumed. Um, in fact, if cattle were able to form their own nation, they would rank third behind China and the United States among the world's largest greenhouse gas emitters. So foods like egg, fish and poultry are a little bit more efficient to produce and have a higher calorie and protein output for human consumption. So what do we do? Because at this point, you're probably scratching your heads a lot more. You're thinking, wow, like how many burgers should I be eating? Um, and to be perfectly honest, the decision is up to you uh, because it's up to you to decide uh, what you want to do and everything like that. It's not for us to decide for anything else. But what we can say is that every small little change matters. So there are different types of diets out there. And we're going to look at some of those diet impacts and how we can reduce carbon emissions and carbon footprints uh, related to that. But small changes matter. And that's the most important thing. Um, some of the easiest things to do is to reduce animal protein sources 
is uh, specifically beef. Um, and looking at an increased vegetable protein intake um, is something that we can all take a look at uh, if you're interested in uh, making some positive change for the environment. Um, and of course, choosing a different variety of proteins. So like the slide pointed out before, there's definitely a big, big uh, difference in regards to um, having beef as the primary protein source versus chicken or eggs and even dairy. Um, and of course, the interesting thing too is there's a lot of research now talking about insect protein and the insect protein, um, specifically cricket protein, that's becoming a little bit more popular in Canada right now. At least it's hit our shelves for the first time. But uh, it's interesting to note that two thirds of the world's population already has some sort of insect protein built into their dietary habits already. So for us, all of us in North America right now, it may seem a little bit crazy, it may seem a little bit extreme, but uh, the rest of the world is already, well, well, well versed in regards to insect proteins. Um, and many, many food writers and critics are actually claiming that this is going to be um, the protein source for in the future. And for those um, looking at sci-fi movies like Blade Runner 2049, there's definitely mention of protein farms where they're looking at insect proteins. Now, cricket protein um, right now has hit the shelves in uh, Toronto and Canada. Uh, and it should be mentioned that all the cricket protein, uh, it's a very, very interesting, um, option it gives uh, a little bit of a um savory barbecue kind of flavor um and it, it's a food choice but unfortunately the amino acid content which we'll talk a little bit more about amino acids in a little bit in a couple more slides is not nutritionally complete so still there needs to be a little bit of planning that goes ahead in regards to um for the vegetarians out there looking at uh Cricket, adding cricket protein into their diet, there still needs to be a little bit more um, planning that goes into replacing everything with cricket protein. But for the people out there that are still eating um, dairy as well as um, eggs, uh, integrating cr uh, cricket protein into your diet is not that big of an issue um, and doesn't require as much planning. So of course, uh, this graph, of course, again, shared by the World Resources Institute, which is gives us some lovely, lovely data in comparison, shows the average US diet right now and the average American Canadian diet, um, the agricultural land use, as well as the greenhouse gas emissions from those foods. Um, so the average US diet, again, remembering uh, over consuming protein, not, uh, not actually requiring that much protein. Uh, and it should be said that, uh, it's very different between an athletic population and a general population, um, but we're obviously trying to capture a little bit of both in this presentation. The average US diet, obviously we can see the amount of uh, emissions that it has as well as the agricultural land use. And then we see other diets like the Mediterranean diet where it has typically about one serving of red meat per month and the rest of the other proteins are focused uh, on uh, seafood use where there's a significant decrease in the agricultural land use as well as greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we then have other dietary changes where if we shift a third of our beef consumption to pork and poultry, uh, like chicken or turkey, then we have a further uh, reduction still. Um, and everything else uh, shifting to beans uh, instead of beef uh, for a third uh, would uh, definitely continue to drop it, reducing the beef consumption by 70%. And of course, the biggest drop of all time compared to the average US diet is vegetarianism. Now, vegetarianism um, here in this graph is represented by lacto-ovo, ha still having uh, eggs and dairy in the diet. Uh, so we unfortunately don't have data for veganism, which is of course a complete removal of animal proteins, including dairy as well as eggs. So we should expect um, from a logistical, rational perspective, that veganism will have further decreases in greenhouse gas emissions and agricultural land use. However, the data is not there yet to uh, fully confidently compare. Now, if we look at this uh, slide, uh, again, from the World Resources Center uh, Institute, we have protein scorecards. Now, one thing I will point out in this slide is that wheat, corn, rice are not exactly the best sources of protein from a dietary uh, consumption. In fact, when we talked, uh, when we counsel vegetarians around this, um, these are considered insignificant sources of protein. So there is a little bit of protein, but nothing 
worthwhile discussion um, versus uh, what we typically do talk about is beans, lentils and legumes, soy and nuts for the vegans, um, as well as eggs for the lacto-ovo population. So the scorecard clearly shows that the uh, low cost uh, availability, the low cost impact on the environment for these food products and of course the price from a retail standpoint because um, we can we always need to be considerate about how uh, where our money is going um, from the changes that we're making from a dietary standpoint and then we of course have uh, the fit uh, we have the chickens the turkeys the poultry um, pork and dairy uh, consumption being medium uh, impact uh, foods and of course high impact foods of course are related to the red meats beef sheep lamb and goat that have the highest environmental impact in regards to agricultural land use water use as well as greenhouse gas emissions so this is a protein scorecard to help you um, kind of visualize and make some changes to your dietary um, choices uh, on a day-to-day -day basis because remember uh, nutrition is a choice that we make at least three times a day for three meals and sometimes snacks as well so these choices these small changes really really add up Okay, great. So now that we've identified our global concerns around animal-based proteins, we'll get right into the meat of it, pun intended. There are so many different classifications when it comes to vegetarianism. There are lacto-vegetarians, ovo-vegetarians, lacto being um, dairy is included, ovo-eggs. There's a combination lacto-ovo-vegetarians that include both uh, dairy and eggs into their diet, pescatarian, which includes fish, flexitarian, which both Ben and Steph had mentioned that they follow this diet where they follow primarily a vegetarian or vegan based diet and do include animal proteins in infrequently, as well as vegans, which exclude all vegetarian, all sorry, animal based proteins. So that includes no egg, uh, no fish, no dairy, and potentially other food sources like honey. So those are the the primary classifications of vegetarianism. Now there are some definite health benefits that are well researched that are associated with a vegetarian or vegan diet. We'll use the term vegetarian to encompass all styles of vegetarianism. So some of the benefits could include, you know, reduction in gallstones, cardiovascular disease, that's your stroke, heart disease, um, arthritis, dementia, cancers, hypertension, uh, diabetes, and we include dementia. Well, we like to say it again because it's a very prominent <laughs> illness that affects a large part of our population, especially the aging population. We can't say it enough. This is uh, another global concern maybe we'll talk about in a, another um, webinar someday. However, you know, if we aren't planning properly, our vegetarian diets risk being inadequate in certain areas and our macronutrients and micronutrients um, there are there tend to be a lot of anti-nutrients as well in a vegetarian diet like phytates that impair absorption of certain nutrients uh, hormonal imbalances so understanding your individual needs and planning uh, your diet out is so key in having a well-balanced vegetarian diet. It is not as simple as just eating meat, you know, cooking something up and putting it on your plate. We do have to make up for the nutrients that would otherwise be found in meat products um, that can be of concern, which we'll talk about. The next slides. So one of the primary concerns uh, with vegetarian diets is protein intake, getting enough protein intake and the right kind. Uh, essential amino acids are of concern. Many vegetarian uh, based proteins do lack some of the essential amino acids that are really important for overall health, but especially for athletes for um, muscle protein synthesis and important hormone development, all of those things. So it's really important to eat the right kinds of food and the right kinds of combinations. Um, as well, really interesting, only 45 to 65% of vegetarian proteins are actually absorbed so because of this vegetarians and need to um, have special combinations of food to meet their requirement especially the athletes whose protein intake uh, protein needs are typically much higher than the average um, individual um, also note there's many micronutrients that may be lacking in a vegetarian diet if not planned out properly like iron b12 
fatty acids, calcium, and cholesterol, and we'll get into each of those in the next few slides. Um, but just really important to note, we wanted to mention that vegetarianism it should be a personal choice. So whether it's for ethical reasons, moral reasons, or health-related reasons, you and only you should decide if this is something you wanna do. And if you aren't interested in going full plant mode, that's okay. Even just reducing consumption of meat, especially beef, in a slow systematic way that can work for you can be really a benefit to yourself, your performance, and even to the environment. So um, vegetarian athletes can have the same um, performance outcomes as omnivores if their diet is properly balanced. So we have increased visibility of some high profile vegan competitors like former heavyweight champion David Hay and the ladies tennis champion Venus Williams. Um, and they're all performing quite obviously well in their sport. So, um, you know, you can definitely achieve that high level of performance um, if your vegetarian diet is properly balanced. Um, we're lacking studies um, in kind of vegetarian athletes, um, comparing them to kind of the omnivores, um, but those will, you know, hopefully be coming around as um, in future years as this is kind of a growing trend. Um, there are some more issues um, kind of in women versus men, but we don't have time to dive into that fully right now. Um, so the problem with these poorly constructed diets is that it, it can predispose individuals to, as we said before, some macronutrient deficiencies, so kind of energy and calories and then protein, as well as the micronutrient deficiencies, as we mentioned before, so the iron, calcium, vitamin B12, zinc, and then creatine and cholesterol. Um, so it's um, a particular concern if we don't pay attention to accommodating these um, nutrients, especially if they're being excluded from the diet um, because we're not eating animal products. Um, so um, getting enough energy or calories can be challenging when following a vegetarian diet because these diets tend to be higher in fiber um, which promotes early satiety. So we obviously can't eat as much if we're feeling um, full. So while these factors might be helpful for weight loss purposes, um, it can be a problem if you're an athlete trying to achieve a high calorie um, need to make sure that you're just getting enough intake to support all your training. Um, some diets can, especially be vegetarian diets, can be lower in fat unless you're eating a lot of nuts and seeds and avocado. Um, vegetarian diets can be uh, lower in this macronutrient. And again, it'll depend on the type of vegetarian. So what kind of foods you're excluding and what foods you are eating. As mentioned previously, um, protein is another um, issue for some vegetarian athletes, um, just because protein requirements for athletes, like we've said, are higher to support that muscle growth, um, repair and recovery from those intense training sessions. Um, like we said before, vegetarian protein isn't typically fully absorbed. So we can only absorb about 50 to 60% um, percent of it. And then vegetarian protein sources aren't always complete. Um, so proteins are made up of amino acids, and there are some amino amino acids that our body can't produce. And these are termed essential amino acids. So um, animal based proteins are considered um, complete, they have all these essential amino acids, but um, a lot of vegetarian protein sources might be lacking in one or more of these amino acids. So it takes a lot of planning to make sure that we're getting enough of them. And again, it's going to depend on the type of vegetarian diet um, that each individual follows. Um, iron is another, uh, it's a micronutrient um, and vegetarians are at higher risk of deficiency um, due to poor absorption. As we kind of mentioned earlier, we have anti-nutrients like phytates that are found in nuts, seeds, beans and legumes and oxalates found in spinach, chard and collards. Um, and these obviously inhibit the absorption um, of iron. Um, generally, vegetarian athletes need almost twice as much um, iron. Supplementation is not 
always well tolerated. Sometimes it can be um, quite hard on the stomach. Um, uh, next nutrient is calcium. Again, higher risk of deficiency due to poor absorption because of um, some of these anti-nutrients anti um, like the oxalates previously mentioned. Um, also a higher risk of deficiency um, because lactose intolerance often becomes more prevalent. 75% um, of the population is generally lactose intolerant after weaning off of breast milk. And it tends to be higher in um, East Asian populations, indigenous and African American populations as well. Perfect, so another couple of nutrients of concern, B12 and zinc. B12 is primarily found in animal proteins and animal products. Um, so unless you want to be eating nutritional yeast every day forever for vegans, supplementation um, is is suggested and encouraged in order to get that really important nutrient, which we will talk about in our formal webinar in greater detail. Also, the requirements for B12 do increase with age um, for various reasons in themselves, so very important to consider, especially because if we're not consuming enough B12, we can become deficient in as little as one month. And it's very, very difficult once you're deficient in B12 to regain and increase your B12 stores to be adequate, adequately, um, to have adequate B12 storage in the body. The other nutrient of concern is zinc. And zinc um, can actually, similar with iron, there are a lot of anti-nutrients that may bind and prevent, sorry, it says iron, but it is zinc absorption. Um, it's kind of in a similar role with iron that we do need to be very smart on how we take it and, you know, not take it with those foods that can prevent um, the absorption of zinc and primarily comes from animal proteins as well. So really important to consider fortified foods when it comes to getting enough zinc in your diet. So the other couple of nu uh, nutrients of concern and to consider, one, uh, new creatine and cholesterol. So when it comes to creatine, creatine is actually part of an energy system in the body. And we use that system in very short, high intensive exercises like weightlifting, sprinting, and jumping. So if you are an athlete who is in one of these sports, um, creatine is a very important nutrient to consider. Now it is found only in animal proteins. So if you're a vegan, and looking to increase and gain in strength and those explosive based movements without creatine you really are going to struggle so that is something that we'll talk about in detail in our webinar on how to get adequate sources of creatine cholesterol is the other nutrient of concern and it is essential for hormone production in the body many different areas like the digestive enzymes making bile salts different hormones and um, Plant-based diets typically lack cholesterol, as cholesterol is found in animal-based foods only. And why this is important is that if we risk being unable to produce adequate hormones that are important in strength and muscle mass, that becomes a problem again when it for our athletes who want to build that strength and um, and protein stores. We do need to be able to develop these hormones to see those gains, um, as well as reproduction. So not being able to produce enough um, hormones for reproductive purposes can also be a concern. And we know that a lot of our vegetarian and vegans um, are typically female as well, so that can be a concern. And yeah, so that's kind of the myth there. We do need, um, we know that we do produce cholesterol naturally, but sometimes for genetic re reasons or based on your own individual lifestyle, potentially what you're producing may not be adequate. So getting some from the diet is definitely not harmful in any way. So you might be wondering now what to do. There's a, there was a lot of information flown at you right now and there. Um, and as we, we would have loved to be able to have the time and capture your attention, we are really appreciative of the fact that we do already have time. And of course, this is what we're gonna do for you. Um, for those of you that are more interested in following a vegetarian diet or a vegan diet to help decrease your impact on uh, the global uh, environment, the carbon footprints and everything like that to make uh, different nutritional choices to uh, help the rest of the world and to help balance out the, the 
carbon emissions, the agricultural land use. Um, and of course, being the ESN Learning Center, what we have developed is the Vegetarian Sports Nutrition Course. So what you can expect from the Vegetarian Sports Nutrition Course is six modules on uh, specifically for vegetarians and vegans um, about how to eat properly to meet your needs. So of course, we're gonna discuss very, very specific uh, requirements for sports and nutrition for vegetarians and vegans um, from the perspective of both endurance athletes as well as strength athletes um, and team-based um, uh, physical activity, um, those kind of things, the macronutrient requirements and the differences in types of proteins and how to combine those proteins together to make sure you have a complete uh, essential amino acid profile and an amino acid profile and a protein profile that will directly stimulate lean muscle mass development and help you burn fat at the same time, which is very, very possible. And that's what we're really, really great at at ESN. And of course, the micronutrient requirements to keep your um, energy levels up, as well as to make sure you're fighting off the free radical damage caused by physical activity in regards to antioxidants, because um, not just having antioxidants is enough, but you have to have the right amount of antioxidants because if you have too much, you can actually cause oxidative damage, uh, which is the thing that you're trying to prevent too. So it's all about dosaging and uh, making sure you're eating the right amounts in your days. Um, and of course, the, with this uh, webinar, what you've learned is there's a lot of micronutrient deficiencies um, that we're going to talk uh, that we have to address as vegetarian supplements and sports supplements specifically. Uh, is, this is really important for you vegans out there um, that are watching this right now as, uh, for the creatine and strength um, micronutrients that Emily was talking about that, uh, you know, we pick uh, vegan friendly uh, brands uh, for you and the good quality brands so that you're not wasting your time um, and that you're getting a good quality safe brand like I said earlier about the um, FDA not doing the best job in regards to our supplements and uh, monitoring them. And of course, nutrition recommendations to help vegetarians optimize their body composition for their sport. So that typically means uh, an increase of lean muscle mass and a decrease of fat mass and the nutritional as well as uh, food timing uh, recommendations that could be done to better optimize this to help build muscle and burn fat at the same time to perform better for your sport. And of course, the very, very practical meal planning for vegetarians. Um, and this is a more of a practical guide of how to do stuff like meal prep, um, as well as um, prepare vegetables in a way that doesn't leach out the nutrients as much as other cooking methods would and keeping the uh, picking the most energy dense and um, uh, nutrient dense foods for you. Now, what also you'll expect to get from this course is of course recipes, uh, smoothie recipes, which are a powerhouse to meet a lot of recommendations, a one week uh, example meal plan, uh, some resources. And of course, for those of you out there that want to confirm what you've learned, optional quizzes that we attach to each one of these modules to make sure you learn the information so you're confident going forward with your lifestyle changes. Now, the Vegetarian Sports Nutrition course goes live one week from now uh, on May 2nd and what we're offering is a pre-release early bird discount of $50 off for the from now until when the course goes live one week from now and of course that discount code uh, entered uh, on the ESN website is gonna be ESN veggie um, now the early bird discount after that uh, is gonna continue for about three weeks after that because we really want people to see the hub see these presentations, live a healthier lifestyle, balance out everything and meet their nutrition recommendations specifically for vegetarians and vegans. Um, because yes, these are positive changes, but like we keep saying, and uh, like we work with a lot of athletes, if we don't plan out these diets properly, then uh, we could be creating more issues than uh, solving more issues out there. So it's definitely, this course is definitely meant to help you guys understand vegetarianism, understand food and the food choices that will not only be for the benefit of the health of the environment and the world, but also to the benefit of the individual and to help meet your athletic goals as well. So keep in mind, uh, so this um, 
course is going to go live immediately after this webinar. So we are very, very excited. And of course, the very, very cool part about this is that we're going to give you all the modules available at one time. So you can basically marathon all these webinars at once if you'd like to or keep watching them over and over and over again to take notes for and keep studying for uh, to really make sure that you're planning your diet and your nutrition food choices in the best way possible. And of course, you can find that on the web store at www.evolvesportnutrition.com. So I wish we had more time to talk to you all today, but unfortunately we don't. Um, but we want to thank you all for tuning in and watching this and learning a little bit more about the uh, choices that you could make for uh, helping the health of the environment and of course like we keep saying um, that doesn't mean that you have to be vegetarian just a small change will help change um, uh, make dramatic uh, changes to the way our world functions and the types of foods that we eat as um, a culture uh, as a country um, and uh, you know all over and it does really really help uh, everyone uh, in the world so small changes matter so take a look at your beef consumption your animal protein intakes um, start make getting a little bit more clever and uh, creative uh, with your meals because I think that's one of the biggest things that the three of us have as is that when we look at planning a meal with it's not looking at just meat as the entree uh, you have to it forces you to be a little bit more creative with your meal planning and uh, that's when a lot of foods can be really really great and of course um, these food choices and this course together um, it's important because we have to still um, we have to make these choices while still maintaining your fitness and your overall health because we definitely cannot have that sacrifice because we definitely at ESN really 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 support the combination of physical activity and exercise together for long-term health as well as uh, for long-term health as well as global health so thank you again and uh, for those of you that are interested we did take a look at quite a bit of research in order to put this together so this is just one of two pages and of course you can expect that there's much much more research being put together for the um, webinar I mean the course the uh, vegetarian uh, athlete course that we're um, we put together for you that goes live right now so again, thank you very much, and uh, thank you very, very much. Uh, we are going to um, what well, we're going to say bye now. So thank you very much for watching. Happy Earth Day, um, and uh, we'll see you very soon. Bye, bye. guys. Bye.